Cool, let's make a start. Hey everyone, very good to see so many of you here. Uh, I think I've met some of you, if not most of you, which is awesome, but uh, I'm already on our global community manager here at Antler, uh, making sure founders like you, all of our investors, advisors, and the wider community uh, have an amazing time while you're with Antler, and also you know, making sure you're super engaged in, in the community uh, once you have finished the Antler experience. Um, and go on to build amazing companies. We're super excited to have Max here today, who's going to talk to us about all things finding product market fit. Uh, so super excited to dive into today's uh, webinar and masterclass on how we can go on to build amazing companies. Um, just to give you an idea of the format, the event is a, an hour, an hour and a half. Um, Max will go through on how to nail that uh, product market fit, and hopefully you can integrate that into your business. Um, and if you guys have any questions uh, towards the end of the event, um, it would be great to uh, have you up on stage and just fire away any questions you may have. If you do need to drop out uh, during the event, this uh, masterclass is being recorded, so we will uh, make this available to you at a later date. But Max, thanks so much for being with us. All over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Raleigh. Well, Afternoon, evening, uh, morning to, to all of you. Really great to meet everyone. Um, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, my name is Max Mankey. I'm the founding partner at GrowthX. We're a seed stage venture capital fund uh, based here in Silicon Valley with a really unique fund thesis, if you want to call it something as, as lofty as that. Um, our belief is that entrepreneurs and their companies are much more successful uh, when they raise capital in the form of revenue from these strange people called customers. Uh, so for us, we're all about finding product market fit. We're all about enabling entrepreneurs to keep more of their business, to be able to stay where they are, not travel all the way to San Francisco, just to be closer to Sand Hill Road. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is what I believe is you know, the most important thing in the world, which is product market fit and how you all can go to market with intent. Um, so we're recording this, so definitely feel free to you know sit in and pay attention and take notes if you want. Um, likewise, I'll be following up with this deck, so you'll have all the tools to it as well. And likewise, uh, there's some there's some pre-reading as well as an actual exercise that you can do to nail your ideal customer profile uh, coming out of uh, coming out of this exercise. So as we go along, feel free to populate the chat. Um, ask any questions. Um, likewise, you know, certainly feel free to check out GrowthX. I just dropped a link um, to our website um, there in the chat. You know, this is how for us as VCs, uh, we take a very different approach to meeting startups, meeting entrepreneurs like yourselves. Um, you'll very rarely either find myself or my co-founder uh, at a pitch event or a demo day. Um, just for us, we believe that the best form of due diligence um, is helping, specifically helping you get to market and talk to your market. And if us as investors and you uh, as go-to-market specialists um, are talking to the market, well, that's the best signal for all of us. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about GrowthX. Um, and again, you know, feel free to populate the questions. I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A. And if, we're, if the questions are just rolling and rocking, we can, we can blow past the time. Um, with that, I'm going to jump in and let's talk a little bit uh, about how we can find product market fit. So why do we launch GrowthX? And likewise, how does that relate to finding product market fit? Well, everybody starts a startup to be successful, right? Nobody starts a startup for it to fail. And we're all trying to avoid being one of the statistics, right? 70% of startups fail, 90% of startups fail or you know, fail to break even. We're all aware of this, right? We know it's an uphill battle. The challenge for most of us entrepreneurs is that it's difficult for us to avoid failure because we actually don't know what are the common causes of failure. It's almost like, why did you fail? Because we failed, right? And it's not really a clear distinction. So when you look at the data, and we did this long ago, back when I founded GrowthX in 2015, and I still check on these studies on a regular basis. I mean, you can look at CB Insights, Startup Genome, uh, uh, Wilbur Labs. They do these studies you know, two or three times a year about why startups fail. And an interesting thing comes out of those studies very consistently, 
we all know that startups fail, but the, the primary reason why startups fail is not, it doesn't have anything to do with products and has very little to do with fundraising. The primary reason why most startups fail is because of markets and primarily people. You know, the most recent study from Wilbur Labs was that the number one cause of failure for most entrepreneurs was running out of money at 37%. It's running out of your runway. 37% of the time when a startup fails, it's because of that reason. And when you look at the top 10 reasons, eight out of 10 of the reasons why a company fails is they don't have product market fit, they fail to you know, have the right pricing model. They, 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 they don't know what market that they're in. And the venture capital community, my colleagues, my peers, have created a very convenient narrative. And that narrative is that, well, you know, there's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs creating products that nobody wants. There's no product market fit. But when you work with as many entrepreneurs as I work with, that philosophy is full of holes. You know, just the Zoom room that we're in right now, do we really think that half of you are coming up with products that have no market, no value in the real world? Absolutely not. They, they, they conveniently blame founders. And the problem is that there isn't a bunch of people creating products that nobody wants. The challenge is that there's a lack of resources to enable entrepreneurs to either get to and identify the right market or actually capture that market. And what you have is failure by Google search result, right? I mean, there's no shortage of accelerators and you, know, you can go to the best MBA programs, Stanford and Harvard and, and their entrepreneurial programs. And they'll tell you everything about raising capital and cap tables and building products but when it comes to go-to-market strategy, acquiring early customers, and how to actually scale a business that doesn't already have secure product market fit, they're completely lacking in content, in context, in, in, in what to do. And so as entrepreneurs, what are we left with? We're left with an ecosystem on the internet that tells us, you know, five things to do to go from zero to a million ARR. Or, you know, use this hack in the subject line to start having better meetings today. And all those things, they're not meant really to be successful. Those are meant as marketing ploys to get us to click somewhere and to get us to buy a service. So it's no wonder that so many startups fail because there's very few resources built into what is product market fit? How do we identify it? And so that's the challenge that we took on at GrowthX. That's how our fund works. We only invest in companies that we can lean into and help grow um, through what we call the Market Acceleration Program or MXP. We provide this both as a fund and as a digital service. And it's a hands-on guide to helping companies find product market fit, increase revenue and reduce sales cycles. We've deployed it all around the world, both inside of our fund and outside of our fund. I've accelerated companies um, from California to Canada to Korea, um, B2B, B2C, FinTech, health tech, ed tech. Um, you know, uh, I've even accelerated an autonomous robotic fish that has a camera on its head and it swims around fisheries and uses AI to say, well, when's the right time to actually you know, harvest that fish? Um, even worked with large corporate innovation teams. Um, so, you know, gone everything from two kids in a garage here in Palo Alto, all the way up to, you know, large fortune 100 businesses. And in all that experience, what I can tell you is that while products and markets may be unique, absolutely, the path to product market fit is not. It's a formula. We don't have to improvise it. We don't have to innovate on it. We don't have to you know, stumble around in the forest trying to be the first person to ever acquire a first customer. Now, don't get me wrong, just because I say it's a formula, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's quick. It takes time. It takes persistent effort. But there's a huge difference between having a playbook and a formula and starting from scratch and acting like we're the first people to ever run an experiment, the first person to ever try to acquire that first customer, that early adopter, to find that beachhead. 
And the other thing that's interesting about this, specifically about product market fit, is that term product market fit. Again, my colleagues in the VC space, they use this term a lot to stage gate and to judge us, right? And to go, well, you're pre-product market fit, you're post-product market fit. We only invest in companies that have product market fit. And then I just ask them, so what is it? I met with a lot of blank stares. And I also push that challenge back onto you. What is product market fit? How do you define it? How do you know that you've acquired it? And you can Google it. You can go and search what is product market fit. And what you'll find is you're going to find, you know, 800 different blog posts, um, you know, half of them quoting, you know, Mark Andreessen, the world's greatest venture capitalist saying it's the most important thing in the world. Thank you. Not a definition though. Uh, and the other half will, you know, quote Eric Ries, um, and he'll say, you know, well, if, if you have to ask if you have product market fit, then you don't have it. Also not a definition. And those are the two primary definitions of product market fit out there. And so when you think about it, everybody's hustling and scratching and hacking and clawing their way to find product market fit, yet we don't have it defined. So how do we get there? I mean, for a lot of folks, product market fit is about as tangible as achieving nirvana. You know, it's like, I think one day I will become self-aware on a cloud and thus I have achieved product market fit, right? Um, but in what other aspect of your life would that be acceptable? And what other aspect of your life or your business would it be acceptable for you to be up late, up early, spending time away from your family and your kids and your friends, not earning a big salary and taking on this huge risky endeavor to achieve an outcome that is largely undefined, right? And so that's that's a large part of what we get into. We, we talk about at GrowthX and, and in the MXP, we need to stop improvising and we need to start going to market with intent. And it's very difficult for us to do that if we don't know where we're going and how we're getting there and we're improvising along the way. I'll get back to my definition of product market fit in a minute, but you know, for us, everything comes back to, for entrepreneurs, really simply the scientific method. When we're trying to find product market fit, we're asking a question, is there a market there? Which market is it? How do we know when we get there? Scientists have been doing this for a very long time, right? But unfortunately, for, for most entrepreneurs, our, our primary strategy is hope. Our primary you know, go-to-market methodology, if you want to call it that, um, is throwing mud on the wall and seeing what sticks. Well, a scientist doesn't do that. You know, a scientist doesn't pour you know, a, two chemicals into a beaker and light it on fire. No. If, if a scientist does that, you know, she's going to burn her, her eyebrows off, right? You know, what a scientist does is she knows exactly how much of chemical A and exactly how much of chemical B and exactly how hot and how long that fire is going to burn for. And before a scientist ever does an experiment, they do two really important things. Number one, a scientist creates the tools to objectively observe the experiment. Make no mistake, scientists don't bring feelings to a data fight. As entrepreneurs, we oftentimes do. We, you know, How often are we saying, well, that person's really interested? Well, what is interested? Is that a feeling or is that an actual data point? How do we measure that interest, right? So we're doing all these activities. You're picking up the phone, you're writing these emails, you're having meetings with people. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So everything that you're doing is creating data. But we, we have to acknowledge that that data needs to be captured in order to better inform our path towards product market fit. The second thing that a really good scientist does before they ever you know, launch an experiment is they come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just an expected result if ideal conditions are met. So what does that mean for us entrepreneurs? It just means we need to think about what's that expected result? What will it look like in really finite terms? And that expected result isn't IPO or Series A. It's a very specific customer getting a very specific product at a very specific price point. And then we just reverse engineer that path for them to get there. What would they need to see? What would they need to hear? How much would it need to cost? And we generate those ideal conditions 
And then we run the experiment. We create a method and then we see if that method holds up. And so for us, product market fit is, ends up being a fairly simple equation. Product market fit is just simply for us at GrowthX and everyone we work with through the market acceleration program is just our ability to acquire revenue using a proven and predictable method. Can I acquire customer one in a similar fashion that I acquired customer two, that I acquired customer eight, that I acquired customer 20? Because once I am able to create predictability and repeatability, it's funny what happens when you have a process and you can repeat that process and you can demonstrate that the market adopts this process of being sold to, of being marketed to, now scale that thing that all of us are in search for, that, that, that in my opinion is the worst word in the entrepreneurial dictionary, scale becomes a natural byproduct. We, once you build a foundation, which is product market fit, once you have a proven playbook to acquire a specific and targeted customer segment and a beachhead, then you can leverage that playbook to start bringing on more people, start spending more on marketing, um, to start reaching a wider audience. And you know, one of the one of the phrases that I think you know really hurts a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, comes from Mark Zuckerberg here in the Bay Area. You know, he infamously said, you know, move fast and break things. Well, all due respect to him, but for most of us, we're not reinventing the internet and backed by one of the world's largest VCs. And moving fast and breaking things sounds good, but it basically says, go forward, be sloppy, and don't worry about your customers or their experience. And so rather than looking at move fast and break things, you know, I tend to look at what the U.S. Navy SEALs approach is. Right, they're one of the most elite fighting forces on the planet, and there's a saying that they've had for 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 decades now, which is, "Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast." Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. What does that mean for product market fit and for entrepreneurs? Well, it's it's pretty simple. When we sweat the details, when we really dive into how we're going to acquire customers, what we're going to say to them, which customers we're going to acquire. Then when we actually act and execute, we move much faster. There's less volatility. There's more predictability. We have more control over the outcome. You know, the Navy SEALs don't just get assigned a mission. They say, all right, great. Let's hop in the helicopter. They jump off and they start firing bullets somewhere. If they're unprepared for that mission for, for who they're up against, and they don't know which specialists to bring, which tools to bring, um, what their exit strategy is, you know, what's, what's the extraction point, what do they do if someone gets hurt, all these contingencies become improvised. So they plan intensely for a long time before that mission ever starts. We need to take the same approach to attacking and going to market. You need to think about the resources that you have the time you have to do it in, i.e. runway. Why are you choosing that market? What tools are gonna to help you be successful in that market? And you need to control as many of the variables as possible so that when you show up in that market, rather than reacting to, to the market and the conditions and the environment, you are moving forward, you're progressing because again, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. The most important part of finding product market fit. And, and, and I'll actually back up quite a bit here. The most important asset that any business has, whether you're again, two kids in a garage or a Fortune 500 business is your ideal customer profile or ICP. And, and I know, you know there, there's no shortage of accelerator programs and books out there that talk about ICPs that mention it, but, but rest assured, I'm not talking about a business model canvas or a lean canvas. I'm not talking about the exercise of writing something on a piece of paper and rotating it 90 degrees and then you know shoving it in your, in your drawer somewhere. Your ideal customer profile is your Google Maps. It's your North Star. It impacts every single one of the known variables that you have to take <clears throat> in order to acquire customers. Why is it so important? Well, once you know who your ideal customer is, then that's going to inform your pricing strategy. How much value can extract? 
That pricing strategy then sets the boundary for your customer acquisition cost. Your customer acquisition cost is then going to inform your customer acquisition strategy and the channels that you use. And the channels are going to inform the medium and the medium is going to inform the messaging. And oh, by the way, the messaging, if it's not super highly targeted towards a specific audience, then that audience won't know it's that, won't know that they're your audience and it won't resonate with them. And that will create friction in a leaky funnel. When I'm working with entrepreneurs and I ask them, what's their ICP? I get incredibly generic results. I mean, this is the one thing that every company could be doing better if they just slowed down and really thought about it. You know, a typical response that I get when I ask a, a, a company looking for capital um, or a company, you know, looking to work with us in the MXP is, you know, what's, what's your ideal customer profile? And they say something like manufacturing or moms for B2C. Moms, moms, moms is an ICP. They're, they're, moms is a, is a TAM. Moms is an incredibly diverse array of human beings and, and, and different sub profiles. You have, you know, you have, you have working moms, you have single moms, you have moms with five kids, moms who are empty nesters. We have to get more specific about this because each of those have very different ways they want to be marketed to. Same thing with manufacturers. Manufacturers, we talking about heavy machinery? We talking about plastic spoons? We talking about a company that does this on the enterprise level? We talking about a company that does this for small businesses? Because those companies have different budgets. They have different behaviors. They have different worldviews. They have different ways that they communicate about what they do. And if we don't appreciate exactly who our customers are, or who we want our customers to be, then all we're going to do is we're going to create friction when we're trying to find product market fit because we're just, we're just simply not targeted. And make no mistake, the reason why we're crafting those ideal customer profiles is because most of us have to, at some point, you know, sell something to somebody. Um, we're here because we're trying to solve a problem and acquire revenue to solve that problem. And I get, you know, I put the S word up on the board here, selling, and it's uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable to so many of us for whatever reason, you know, fear of rejection. We weren't taught how to do it. Um, society tells us that salespeople are bad people. Well, put all of that aside. As an entrepreneur, we, we have to be front and center of our business. Nothing happens without us first starting the activity, picking up the phone, writing the email, reaching out to the market. Demand won't come until you build momentum first. And, and, and the most important thing as it relates to your ICP and, and selling in general is that selling is helping. You're not here to convince anybody to change their opinion. You're not here to show someone about you know, your AI and your ML and your data features and all the different product features that you have because that's not helping anybody. Rather than entering conversations to talk and demo, you need to be entering conversations and entering ICPs to seek fit. Do you have a problem that my product has the high likelihood of creating value for you? Because that's what it's about. It's not about us acquiring value. When we're talking about an ICP, what you're looking for is who can you create the most value for with the least amount of effort. And if you focus on that and you drill that ICP down, that's where you will find product market fit. So one of the challenges that I see when, when working with entrepreneurs and we're crafting or we're thinking about that ICP is again, you know, it's, it's moms or it's manufacturers. We, we have to appreciate the details and get so much, so much deeper, so much closer to the friction to our customers than that. We can't really help people if we can't ask them questions. If we can't get inside their shoes, if we can't understand their keystrokes. You know, I was saying this way before COVID, but it's even more true now. All of us are just, you know, sitting at home in our sweatpants in front of a 13 inch square box, you know, pounding away on the exact same looking keyboard. And somehow each of our keystrokes creates different profits and different losses, creates different, you know, problems and gains. And so oftentimes when, when we're talking with entrepreneurs to talk about, you know, all right, well, who's your ICP? And they say things like Nike or Amazon or Coca-Cola. 
The problem with that as an ICP is that those are companies and companies can answer questions. And most importantly, companies don't buy anything. People do. It's people within those companies. It's, it's people with specific titles, with a specific budget, with a specific job function. And the way that they do their job and the frequency of, of certain jobs that they do creates problems. And those problems have leakages onto the P&L, the P&L of that business. And so if I go to Amazon, if I go to Walmart, if I go to Nike and I ask them, hey, what are your, what are your 2022 you know, strategic goals? They can't answer that question because their fonts and characters uh, with colors, there's no one there to answer that. But if I ask Nike and Walmart and Adidas, you know, hey, what are your 2022 strategic goals? But I asked that question consistently to the head of North American retail real estate. Well, those people have very similar functions at a very similar level, and they have very similar concerns, and they're actually competing with one another. And now I can really get into the weeds of their keystrokes and understand what their problems are, and I can effectively test how much value I can help create for them and their business if I'm able to solve those problems. So we have to get incredibly close to our customers. We have to do the non-scalable things in order to create that playbook that unlocks scale. And so with any business, right, we have, we have to get down to that subatomic level. We have to break down these ICPs and start, as I said before, getting their keystrokes, getting in their behaviors, what we have to acknowledge in the process of creating that ideal customer profile is that every business has an, a big blue ocean of ideal customer profiles available to it, right? And as an investor, I see it all the time, right? It's, you know, slide 17, we have a $6 trillion TAM opportunity. Absolutely wonderful. I'm sure that you do. But just keep in mind that your TAM is an incredibly large, diverse array of ideal customer profiles. And not only do most of us not have anywhere near the resources to support our TAM, we would be crushed under the weight of it. But if we try to market to our TAM in general, if we try to be something to everyone, then we're not gonna be relevant. We're not going to catch the attention of anyone. So rather than focusing on acquiring your TAM, you should, Put your TAM away, leave it on your investor deck. Instead of trying to acquire your TAM, let's focus on acquiring your beachhead because it's not about Mr. and Mrs. Right. It's about Mr. and Mrs. Right now. Who has the biggest problem that you can solve for today, given the size of their problem, given their willingness to solve that problem, given your runway? given the amount of time that you need to acquire that capital, given the stage of your product. Because so often, again, why do so many startups fail? 37% of them run out of cash. So when you're thinking about how do, I, how do I choose? How do I prioritize that ideal customer profile? It's really simple. How much runway do you have? And what time is that gonna, runway gonna run out? And if I look at these customers, which one of them is gonna help me do two things, learn, and protect my runway so that I can continue to build a use case and a beachhead before the clock runs out. And we'll dive a little bit more into some of the levers you can pull onto later, but it's not about Mr. and Mrs. Right. It's about Mr. and Mrs. Right now. And you know, a great example of a TAM that almost went awry was with you know uh, uh, Robin Hood and, and the whole GameStop frenzy. I mean, you know, Robin Hood's a big company. And almost overnight, the retail investor TAM came pouring into their, their, their investment app and they almost crashed, right? A company that large, they can barely handle their TAM. What, what makes us think we can handle the TAM, right? So the, the last thing I'll point to that is, I know that it is personally difficult, that it is a challenge that we're always facing shiny object syndrome, that we're always, you know, that we're always battling fear of missing out or fear of a better option. And just keep in mind, we're not saying 
you know, you can only be with one ideal customer profile for the rest of your life. Absolutely not. We have to just acknowledge that your resources as a company, as a founder, are extremely limited. You know, every founder I know has three full-time jobs, product uh, development, market development, and fundraising. There just simply aren't enough hours in the day to be going after multiple markets. And there's never going to be any certainty about what's the right market or what's the wrong market. But as I'm going to show you, there's certainly a process of elimination that you can go through to highly de-risk that effort to protect your runway. And if you're successful, increase revenue while shortening sales cycles by just being thoughtful, intentional, and removing friction. So what's one of the ways that we can start to de-risk that process? You know, it's, it's, it's by focusing on having the right conversations with the right people. So many of us are far too focused about qualifying in. Let's bring more folks into the funnel when we should be focused on qualifying out. Who are the people who do not, who should not earn the right to have time on my calendar as an entrepreneur? Again, a person has three full-time jobs. And I go through this exercise with, with entrepreneurs in the early stages of the MXP all the time. They say, oh, I just don't have enough time. I'm really trying to get control of my go-to-market strategy, but I just... The calendar is too full. And what we do is we do, we do an exercise where we go a month back in the calendar, we go a month forward in the calendar, and we just look at and dissect every meeting. And we just go, was this person within your ICP or were they not in your ICP? Usually about 60% of people were not even in the ICP, wrong title, wrong industry. It was a meeting where we hoped for something good to shake out of it. And then we also asked the question, well, what did you want to get out of that meeting? Well, I demoed the product and they said that they were interested. And then you just look at, well, what happens from meetings where they're interested? And I'm sure plenty of people on this, you know, on this webinar are familiar with it. You know, you go in, you meet with, um, you know, a couple of individuals that a company you're really excited about, your product works the way you want it to work, your slide decks are on point, you hit all your talking points, the meeting comes to an end. They say, wow, this was this was so great. We really appreciate it. Can you put together some collateral and send it to me? What I'll do is I'll run up the flagpole to the rest of the team and we'll get back to you. And what happens? We feel really good about it until a couple of weeks go by and we never hear back from them, right? Because we didn't spend that time qualifying out. So what we do a lot of with, with companies that we're working with in the MXP is we talk about identifying companies that share your worldview. We don't want to give away, or we don't want to give access to our time to anyone who doesn't have a high likelihood, a high predisposition to working with us. And, and, and what do we mean by worldview? It's really simple. Again, we're creating this ICP. We're doing all this work to acquire customers because that's where product market fit comes from, to acquire revenue. So what's the single most important breadcrumb that you should be on the lookout for? It's really simple, budget. We only want to work with either consumers or businesses where we can follow the breadcrumbs of where they have previously and where they are currently deploying budget for solutions that would make them likely to deploy budget with us. So, you know, what are some examples of worldview? Well, the most classic example comes, of course, from crossing the chasm, right? You talk about innovators and early adopters and early majority, of course, you got that chasm in between. Well, unfortunately, you know, there isn't a, a simple way to just, you know, Google search early adopters. There isn't, you know, a LinkedIn badge for early adopters. So how do we find them, right? It's a simple exercise. If I was an early adopter, what would be some of the things I would be doing? So you start looking at companies and you start seeing who is a corporate venture capital unit, who runs or sponsors accelerator programs? Who has a corporate innovation team? Who regularly acquires uh, or invests in startups? Those are activities that have risk involved in them. That makes them early adopters. No, by the way, that, that corporation that has a corporate venture capital unit or sponsors startups, those activities, they're not free. And they're certainly not charity. They're not writing them off for tax purposes. 
when you see an organization with an innovation team, when you see an organization spending money on accelerators or, or on incubators, that's an expression of their worldview, of their business model. They believe at the highest level of corporate governance that if they send money out the door to work with startups, that those dollars will come back in the door and bring friends back with them. Again, they're not spending the money to spend it. That's not how businesses work. They expect to get an ROI out of it. Uh, you know, what are some other examples? If you're looking at simply a company's website, you know, and the, the website is fresh, the blog is, you know, is, is frequently populated. You go onto, you know, their missions, they talk about they're tech driven, they're innovative. You go look up some of the employees and the CEO and you read their LinkedIn profiles, the same thing. They want to make change, they're agents of change, they're innovators. If that messaging is built into their DNA, it'll show up on their website. At the same time, you look at a company and their website's kind of wonky. It's got a couple of broken links. You scroll down to the bottom, it says copyright 2018. You know, their most recent blog post is from 2017, announcing that they hired a new CMO, but you look her up on LinkedIn and she left two years ago. What do those breadcrumbs tell you about that company's worldview? What is it going to be like working with that company? Does that company value its own, you know, public facing image? And if not, where are they deploying capital? And are they tight fisted? Or are they, you know, are they actively trying to stay ahead of the game? And the last example I'll give for, for, for worldview is an example, I mean, I think we'll, we'll all resonate and be familiar with. So, and, and it's in the airline industry, right? So let's just imagine I was creating a product that, uh, that created blazing fast Wi-Fi for, for, for airlines. So, you know, you could start watching YouTube TV and HBO Max and all those wonderful things. You know, streaming, you don't have to download it ahead of time. Now, what most entrepreneurs would do is they'd say, well, my go-to-market strategy is the airline industry, right? But as consumers, having flown a bunch of different airlines, what do we know? We know that not every airline treats us consumers the same way. You know, some are friendlier than others. Some of them are friendlier than others to, to, their, to their airplanes and to their staff. They don't share the same worldview. And so when you look at the airlines, you know, who are the best airlines? Consistently year in and year out, it's Singapore Airlines, United Arab Emirates. Well, those companies, are they the two luckiest companies, you know, airlines in the world? Are they, do they have the ratings agencies in their pocket? No, those companies get on those lists and stay on those lists by consistently deploying capital capital and budget into their product. They understand that if they invest in themselves, that that's going to create a better customer experience. It's going to create better marketing, and they're going to be able to retain customers and get those customers to fly with them more and bring on new customers. They understand that the business model and their worldview is if we spend money on our product, the customers will come. Now, on the flip side, you know, here in the U.S., we have several different budget airlines. One of them is called Spirit Airlines. Um, these big, ugly yellow planes, you know, a plane flight pretty much costs less than a bus ticket. Um, and for Spirit Airlines, you know, a successful flight is not whether or not you enjoyed the flight. A successful flight is that they got you from point A to point B and your heart's still beating. And if your luggage shows up, you know, they're thrilled. They, they can't believe that they were able to pull that off. Now, Spirit Airlines is not at the top of anybody's list, unless that list is the worst airlines that you should never fly list, right? They, just like, just like Singapore and United Arab Emirates, they didn't get to that list on accident, right? I mean, they certainly didn't, didn't get there on purpose and don't want to be there, but it's not like they have bad luck. It's an expression of their worldview. And if you look at Singapore, or if you look at Spirit Airlines, Spirit Airlines doesn't have Wi-Fi on their airplane today, right now. And this is where a small but incredibly common misinterpretation of signal happens to a lot of entrepreneurs. Well, hey, Spirit doesn't have Wi-Fi and I'm selling Wi-Fi, so that's a natural fit. I should immediately knock on their door. 
when it's the exact opposite. You should run from the hills, delete their name from your memory because Spirit Airlines is actively choosing not to give their customers that experience. You know, if I bumped into the CEO of Spirit Airlines on the street and I said, hey, are you by any chance aware that all of your competitors have Wi-Fi? It's not like he would go, what? What? No one told me this. This is crazy. Absolutely no one, you know, everyone else has Wi-Fi. The CEO of, of Spirit Airlines is perfectly well aware when he's checking emails on his private jet that has Wi-Fi paid for by his customers who don't have Wi-Fi. He's perfectly aware that his business model and worldview is to cut as many costs as humanly possible because it's not the customer who matters, it's the bottom line. And in every single industry, and again, B2B or B2C, there's this diversification. There's this specialization of worldview where you can get hyper-targeted on the people who have the highest likelihood to give you the most amount of revenue for the least amount of effort. But again, you have to go slow to go fast. I'll share just, just one more example on worldview. Um, I was working with a major food producer in Canada and their innovation team. And they had recently pivoted to creating plant-based foods. They acquired a company and they are going through this whole exercise and they're going through the market acceleration program and they're tr trying to figure out, well, how do, we, how do we get this product out there in the market, right? Large company, millions of dollars to spend for from a marketing standpoint, everything they had done to date didn't work. Well, when we look at current strategy, as I kind of alluded to earlier, their target market was moms. And it was a really simple question. Well, do all moms buy plant-based foods? No. Do, which moms are more likely to buy plant-based foods? Are they the moms that shop at Whole Foods or the moms that shop at Walmart? Well, it's obvious. It's the moms that shop at Walmart or excuse me, who moms that shop at Whole Foods, right? It's the moms who already buy certain things and buy plant-based things at, at, at Whole Foods. And so that's where you get started. You start targeting, okay, so who lives near Whole Foods? What type of people shop there? What are the other things that they tend to buy that would make them more likely to jump in and buy this food? And then you start looking at what Facebook groups are they in? What local mom Facebook groups are they in? What local mom Facebook groups talk about Whole Foods and which Instagram influencers talk about healthy eating habits for their kids and environmentally friendly food habits for their children. And once you focus down on that market, that is the lowest hanging fruit. Well, that company all of a sudden saw revenue jump consistently five quarters in a row now because they know what their beachhead is. And once they acquired that beachhead, that beachhead naturally grew. And, and, and the last point I'll make about worldviews, again, this is all just about finding where is budget already being deployed. And for us as entrepreneurs, I think many times we misunderstand exactly how budget gets deployed and where it comes from. And the first point I'll make to that is that for us, it, it feels like somebody's giving us revenue, somebody's giving us capital, but it's actually the opposite. From the customer standpoint, they're not spending money on you or even with you. They are deploying budget or spending their hard-earned cash on themselves because it's what's in it for them. It's what you do for them. It's an investment. So when you're talking about who shares your worldview, just to boil all that back down, it's not just looking at the companies that spend money, but you want to look at the companies that are clearly, that clearly already buy into the concept that you have to spend money to make money or the people who understand that it's worth spending a premium in order to get you know, better or different results. And so as we're thinking about budget, as we're thinking about you know, understanding the, the, the process of where it comes from, we have to understand who is the buyer. And for a lot of folks, this is also not part of the conversation of an ICP. Again, a lot of times what people have is an ideal company profile. Well, I wanna go after it again, Nike or Coca-Cola. But, but where budget consistently comes from is the economic buyer. There's one individual within any business who, is, who, has, who, who has control of the PL, of the profit and loss statement. And make, make no mistake, within any organization, the higher and higher up you go, 
there's the less people are tuned in to how the company works, how the stuff gets made, and the more that they just simply care about profit, loss, share price. And so the challenge for each of us as we're as we're crafting this ideal customer profile, and again, your ICP is going to impact every single step of finding product market fit and acquiring customers. You have to zero in on the economic buyer because all of your communication, all of your campaigns, all of your strategy has to be tailored to speak that person's language, to solve that person's problems, and to fix what they're looking at every day, which is the P&L. And make no mistake, you know, your product might not ever actually touch the economic buyer. It might actually only be with their users, with their employees. But the employees and the technical buyers and the champion buyers, the, the reason why you want to avoid spending too much time with those folks is because they don't have budget. They can scream, I want this, I need this. But if there isn't an economic use case for it, then you'll get a whole lot of people like, you know, uh, this happens all the time. You're, you're talking with someone who's on an innovation team. Well, the innovation person, the person in the innovation department, they don't have budget to spend with you. They're internally running around other departments trying to get budget from them. So you can spend a whole lot of time with, you know, an innovation associate or a director of innovation, but if they don't have budget, they don't have any power or any of authority. Likewise, as we're, as we're just understanding who buys, it's also important to understand a little bit about, you know, why do people buy? And just to back up a little bit, there's, there's four reasons why any business buys. And all of them are totally practical. Make money, save money, acquire or grow a competitive advantage, and stay out of jail, compliance. Those are the only four reasons why any economic buyer buys. And again, it goes back to worldview. It's just simple economics. Are you going to help me increase profits? Or are you going to help me cut costs, right? So when we think about attracting or finding or acquiring that ideal customer profile, we can't come into a conversation seeking interest, talking about how great our you know, features are and how long our team has been around. We have to focus on the problems that we can solve for them. What is it that they're doing today? And how is that hurting their ability to make money, save money, acquire a competitive advantage, or stay out of jail? And for B2C, the rules are the exact opposite. While businesses only buy for practical reasons, consumers are entirely emotion driven, right? I mean, look at an iPhone. Um, you know, there are, there are plenty of great phones out there that don't cost as much as an iPhone, but you know, people still buy them because, well, for some it's a status symbol, for others, they don't wanna to change to a you know, scary new operating system. And for others, you know, all their friends text in blue. They don't want to be the person texting in green, right? So when we think about consumers and how they buy and the problems that we solve for, you need to think about the emotional impact of, as I said before, those keystrokes, the emotional impact that's not being served by the way that they're doing things today. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, here in the US, we have pharmaceutical commercials on TV. And by the way, I know everybody's on streaming devices these days and there's very few commercials to, to watch, but as entrepreneurs, I strongly recommend you watch some good old fashioned commercial TV and put the, put the, the, the closed captioning on because television commercials are master classes at teaching marketing about demonstrating the ICP, the messaging, and the problem that they're trying to solve for. So, you know, classic examples of pharmaceutical commercial for, for, for arthritis, you know, here in the U.S. And when you see that commercial, what you don't see is, you know, images of grandma, you know, in a dark room with bags of ice on her knees. They also don't spend 90 seconds explaining to you how you take a pill and the pill gets digested and goes into your kidneys and enters the bloodstream and then starts attacking the arthritis and resolves the pain. No. Is that what the product does? Yes. It's the same thing to the entrepreneur showing up on the Zoom and just talking about how the product was built and what it's sitting on and its features. 
grandma doesn't care at all about what the arthritis medicine does. When you see that arthritis commercial, what you see is images of grandma running in a field on a sunny day with her grandson and granddaughter while, you know, cheap, you know, a cheap wedding band version of them walking on sunshine plays in the background. Why are they doing that? Why is that every arthritis commercial? Because they're not selling the, the resolution of pain. What they're selling is the acquisition of joy because that's the problem. That's the impact. It's not that arthritis gives grandma pain. It's that the pain takes away her joy. It takes away her ability to do the things that make her happy. So it's not take this pill and your pain will go away. That falls short. It's take this pill and get your joy back. And by the way, you can do the same thing with B2B. You have to focus not on problems, but on impact. It's not, hey, I'm going to give you this data and therefore you will be smarter, right? No one goes out into the market looking to buy a data solution. They look to solve a problem, a problem on their P&L, their business. And so you have to contextualize to that economic buyer exactly what it is that you do and how you do it. So let's start getting a little bit more tactical, practical about crafting these ICPs. So we've talked about who buys, why people buy, trying to identify that, uh, that you know, economic buyer and trying to uh, figure out the people who share your worldview. Now we want to start putting pen to paper. We want to start actually brainstorming ICPs. And by the way, again, I'm going to follow up with a link to our ICP template. And for us within the MXP, this is by far the most important aspect. I mean, for us, for several VCs, for several accelerators we work with, it's a very simple stage gate. Until you have a clear, tangible, ideal customer profile, there's no way that, that you've achieved investor readiness or product market fit. And so where do we get started? Again, you have a TAN. You have multiple different ideal customer profiles available to you. And what we want to do is we want to start breaking each one of those down and, and breaking them down into their parts and pieces of what would it look like for you to go to market with that ICP today, with the tools, the resources, the runway that you have. And what we're really talking about here is doing a puzzle, right? For many of us, choosing your ICP is very difficult because A, it feels scary. There's, there's not a sense of certainty to it. But B, all of those facts and figures and insights that you have about your business, and make no mistake, you're the world's expert on your own business, they're sitting in your head where details get lost and they get corrupted by subjectivity and emotion. So we have to get all those different ICPs out of your head and onto paper. We have to start breaking them down. And it's similar to a puzzle. In your head right now, there's a bunch of pieces scattered around. But what do you do with a puzzle? You take the box, you flip it upside down, you spread out all the pieces. And where do you start every time? Start with the edge pieces. And once you start filling in the edge pieces, i.e. once you start asking the questions about how would this actually work together before you start tackling the whole thing and really commit to this puzzle, funny thing happens. You start being able to see the picture come together. And so that's, that's our approach to ICP. So let's take, a, let's take an example. You know, let's just say you have an enterprise ideal customer profile. It's a classic place where, where people get started. Well, the enterprise is exciting because our average contract value will be $100,000, $150,000. Oh, wonderful. All we need is one customer. We'll be very successful as a business. Well, here's the problem with that, with that $100,000, $150,000 ACB. The time to close for a deal like that is 12, maybe 18 months. And your runway is six, maybe four or five months. So right there, you have an inherent conflict. You've decided to go after a customer profile where we know that the time to close a deal of that size is not compatible with your runway. And don't get me wrong, I know I just explained that incredibly, you know, simply and clearly, and it seems like, well, who would make that mistake? Since I've been investing in startups, there's not a week has gone by where I haven't met a company that's doing a seed plus uh, or a pivot round because they ran out of capital and the, the, the pitch to the investors is, 
Well, we learned that it's not a fit for the enterprise, but it's a much better fit for you know, SMBs, so we're pivoting. No, you burnt up your last tranche of investment going down a rabbit hole that was largely avoidable. So why should an investor give you more capital? How are you wiser this time? An avoidable mistake, right? And this goes back to an old startup you know, adage again, you know, ready, fire, aim, right? Shoot first and ask questions later. Well, it's funny what happens when we just ask a couple of questions beforehand, how much faster and effective we can be in the market. So let's just change the ideal customer profile up again. Let's say we go after a, a mid-market or an SMB ideal customer profile. And that average contract value is $5,000 a year. So the time to close is three to six weeks. Wonderful. And your runway is still a little bit tight. So this average contract value, you know, you'll start seeing revenue, but you need to do a lot of deals in order for that revenue to consistently protect your runway. Well, now you got to consider your team. Does your team have the bandwidth to do 5, 10, 15 of those deals per month, which would require you to support 100, 150 leads per month, which is like 20 to 30 sales activities per day? Does your team have the bandwidth for that? Maybe, maybe not. But here's the great thing. All of these pieces are movable. They're adjustable. And when you can get them to be holistic and in harmony with one another, then you're able to protect your runway, acquire revenue, and do that in a way that's aligned with your goals, with your time, <laughs> um, with, your, with, with the bandwidth of your team and the expertise of your team. And what we're talking about here is giving you the best chance of success to acquire the most amount of revenue from the least amount of effort. And what you'll see that's missing from here is the actual discussion of who that ideal customer profile is. So once you actually have that economic buyer in that person as an early adopter, and you've identified they're already spending budget, now the question is, well, what would it look like for me to go through all these steps and for them to spend budget with me. And as you come up with five, 10, 15 ideal customer profiles, that's not an exercise that takes longer than afternoon. What happens is you're able to compare each one. You're able to measure them and weigh them and touch and feel them and say, boy, nine out of 10 of these don't make any sense, but one of these actually is pretty strong. Does that mean that that becomes your ideal customer profile forever? No. It just gives you enough information to go a little bit further, run a little bit more intentional experiment, see if you can't validate what you've put together on paper with a couple of human beings out in the real world. So how do we actually create that ICP? Now that we're getting in, you know, you've created multiple, uh, uh, you're creating multiple profiles. How do you create one profile? First, you start off with an ideal industry. And you absolutely need to pick an ideal industry because if you don't pick a specific industry, then again, you're widening your market. And the wider you go, the more diluted your messaging and your pricing and your customer acquisition strategy becomes, the weaker it becomes. From there, you start picking out the ideal companies. Again, who's Spirit Airlines, who's Sp Singapore Airlines. And if you don't take a little bit of time to actually identify those ideal companies, well, you might get all the way to the bottom of this and find out that you've got you know, a great ICP, but then you might go out to market and realize there actually aren't a whole lot of ideal companies there. Maybe the whole industry is full of you know, uh, laggards as they're referred to. Once you identify an ideal company or as we put it for, for uh, B2C, ideal, ideal communities, right? You think Facebook groups, Instagram groups, all those wonderful things. Now you start looking at ideal departments. Where's the budget going to come from? And then within that department, who has the budget? Who has the authority? And this is where it gets really interesting. As you've heard me talk about before, we have to get into the keystrokes. We have to leverage empathy and curiosity and business acumen with these individual humans to understand how do they do their job. And so now that you've narrowed it down to a very specific person in a very specific department and a very specific company, now we can start to ask questions and we can verify those questions about how they do their job and what matters to them just simply using LinkedIn. And so what are you, what are you in search of? 
Well, there's really only one thing that matters to your economic buyer. And frankly, there's only one thing that matters to, to the consumer. And those are metrics. All of us, every single one of us have metrics that we are measured by, right? Whether you're the CEO, whether you're the maintenance man, every single one of us have to meet with our bosses, meet with somebody at some point where we say whether or not we're doing a good job. You want to know the classic answer to the, to the question, you know, what keeps you up at night? It's those metrics. It's whether or not you're hitting those metrics. And so the challenge for each of you entrepreneurs is to tie a direct line of correlation between your product features and the metrics of your ICP. Because if you solve one of their top three, four, five metrics, if you don't move the needle for one of the things that actually keeps them up at night, that dashboard that they look at every day, it's gonna be nearly impossible to get their attention in email. It's gonna be hard to get time calendar to get them to move your product into their business. And they're just simply not going to feel the pain enough to do anything to resolve it. So how do you actually go about finding what those metrics are? Again, just go into LinkedIn, research 10, 20, 50 people with these very specific titles. And guess what they'll do? They'll tell you. They'll tell you in excruciating detail exactly what their metrics are, what their responsibilities are, what tools that they use. And if you don't find enough satisfactory answers there, you don't even have to leave LinkedIn. You click on the jobs button. You search for jobs for that specific role. And the recruiters will tell you in even more excruciatingly clear detail. We're looking for people with this background who can achieve these results, who can achieve these goals. And this is how you start the process of validation. This is the scientific method being borne out, right? You now have a target. You now have a control group. And what you're trying to see is if this control group has this specific pain and is it a priority for them? And then you're going to go out to LinkedIn and you're going to see if people mirror that back to you. And if you see that just early indicator in an exercise, again, you can do it in an afternoon. That's the first sign of validation. That's the first sign that there's a market with a problem that you solve with a person who spends money to solve it. And now you can move forward to start having conversations with them and understand what their issues are and the value that you create. So let's take a look at an example. This is Aptology. This is a company that uh, I'm an investor in, um, at, in our fund at GrowthX. Um, and I led them through the market acceleration program. Uh, and Aptology is a behavioral analytics platform for hiring and employee engagement. So you think about um, Myers-Briggs or DISC profiles. Um, and those are very generic, right? You get a you get a group of letters, you know, ENTJ, IF, you know, PJ or something, and it tells you that you're going to be a good actor or lawyer. But what Aptology does is it takes those behavioral analytics, matches them with actual employee performance data, so that a company can say with about a 95% degree of accuracy whether or not someone will not only be good at their job, but be a top performer at their job based off their personality type. Now, what's exciting about Aptology from an investor perspective is absolutely terrifying about Aptology being the person who is in charge of acquiring their first customers, which is everybody needs this. Might not sound like it, but every single company could fit some way, some form, into our product, which again, huge TAM, because let's just look at hiring, for example. Everybody hires the same way, right? Recruiter reads a bunch of resumes. Oh, I like the school that she went to. He has a gap in work history. Um, her font on a resume was weird and it was two pages long. Uh, he has a funny looking name that sounds dear my tribe, my community. All of these are subjective. All of these are feelings. None of them have anything to do with whether or not those four candidates would actually be successful in the role. And it creates inefficiency and it creates bad hires. So let's just boil Aptology down. What does Aptology solve for for a business? It's really simple. Aptology helps solve for expensive, subjective hiring decisions. Hiring decisions at a high cost with very few tangible data points. 
So who's our best IP? Okay, so you start looking at high cost hiring, right? Lawyers, data scientists, software engineers, architects, doctors, right? Are these people hired subjectively? Are they expensive? Yes. Are they hired subjectively? No, they have advanced degrees. They have to take tests. They have to get certifications. There, there, are, there are quantitative tests you can give them to see if they're any good at what they do. So is there a problem there? Yes, but is it a big problem? No. So where else are we looking at high, high wage jobs that are highly subjective? Well, salespeople. There's, there's no college degree for sales. There's very few certifications out there. Yet, you know, at the time we were doing this in San Francisco, it's not uncommon for your everyday sales rep to cost $100,000, $150,000 a year, $200,000 if you build it all in. And so that's where we started digging in. And as I started doing some of the research, found two incredible statistics. Cost of one bad sales hire to an enterprise organization is about 150 to 150 or 150 to $200,000. Cost of one bad sales manager is about $1.5 million. Now, I don't care if you're Salesforce or Oracle or Google, that'll burn a tremendous hole in your PL. So that's where and how we got started. Our ideal industry were mid market and enterprise technology companies where growth was a huge factor. Our ideal companies were first of all, large sales teams, companies that had over a hundred reps. Why? Again, frequency of pain is a big part here. If somebody is just a sales company, right? If they have 10 people or 20 people, well, they're probably not hiring that often. So yeah, it hurts when they make a bad hiring decision, but it doesn't hurt that bad. It's not bleeding the company out. You have a hundred plus people on your sales team. You're probably hiring one or two people every month, maybe even more frequently. Likewise, our product works better the more, the more data points that we have. So a huge part to your ICP is knowing the use case and putting your product in a position where it'll be successful. What else did we look for for our ideal companies? Any company that is on a list of best places to work for, best places to sell for, best company culture, five out of five glass door ratings. Why were any of those companies that met that criteria are ICP. It's really simple. Companies that are best places to work for five out of five glass door ratings. Again, you've heard me say it before. They don't get there on accident. They get there by spending money on best practices and people to acquire and attract and retain the best talent. You know, the company that has one out of glass, one out of five glass door ratings and a terrible reputation, and terrible turnover, could aptology help them? Absolutely. But they'd have to get out of their own way first. They would have to change their behavior. They would have to change their worldview. That company with one out of five stars for, for hiring and worst place to work and high turnover, they'd never spend a dollar to save. To, 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 to change that. They would rather trip over 10 cents to get to a dollar. So I don't work with those people. Um, what were the right departments for us? It was sales and HR. Who is the primary influencer? For us, it was the chief revenue officer. And so I read the LinkedIn profiles of over 200 CROs within the tech space. And what I found in reading those were an incredibly consistent message, right? Their job is to increase revenue, keep growth up to pace, and keep the cost per hire down, right? So they got to grow revenue, they got to grow the team while not letting that team eat the revenue growth. So it's really simple. As we boil it down to our specific use case, if the CRO hires the wrong salesperson, that salesperson won't hit quota, so that person won't make enough money for the business. So there's an opportunity cost. If I help them, they're going to hire the right person, that person will hit or exceed quota, that'll help the business make money. If they hire the wrong person, they have to replace that person, which means their cost per hire doubles. If I can help them avoid a bad hire, that means they don't have to hire another person, which means they save money. So I've got two out of the four reasons why any business would buy straight off the bat. And you saw that the logic, the arithmetic to get there wasn't terribly complicated. So when we boil all that down, we end up with 
our unique value proposition. This is actually what we went to market with. This is what we used for, for one of the most successful email campaigns I ever ran, which was Aptology helps CROs at industry leading technology companies increase revenue while decreasing the cost per new hire through our predictive hiring technology. Now there are three incredibly tangible and important things that are happening here. Number one, notice when I talk about what we do, what Aptology does, predictive hiring technology. It's the last thing I talk about, why? Well, what has human psychology taught us for centuries? What does it say everybody's favorite topic is? It's themselves, right? I know our urge is also when we're writing our unique value propositions, we're building our website, our urge and our instinct is to talk about ourselves as if that's the thing that serves the reader, but it's the exact opposite. The reader wants to get to the point, what's in it for me? Start talking about me. What's the second thing that we do to make this effective? We'd say right at the front, Aptology helps CROs. Who am I sending this to? I'm only sending this to CROs at industry leading technology companies. How is that impactful? Look at the UX of this. As soon as the reader reads this, there's no friction. There's no questioning. Who is this for? Why, why should I read this? I'm working with people like you at companies like yours who are doing exactly what you're doing. So you should listen up. That's an incredibly more targeted and more relevant message. And that tees them up for the third and most important part of, of this value proposition, of this elevator pitch that gets unlocked from this exercise, which is increase revenue while decreasing the cost per new hire. Those, those, that phrase, those, those metrics weren't chosen out of a hat. Again, I read the profiles of over 200 different CROs and consistently those were metrics that they communicated. So just think about what we're doing there. When I'm communicating to them, I'm serving their own words back up to them on a platter. They say on their LinkedIn, I'm in charge of increasing revenue and managing the growth of my team. And I'm reaching out as if I'm some kind of magician here. <laughs> hey, I help people who are working in your position increase revenue while growing your team. And that's how you create synchronicity. That's how you reduce fraction, friction. That's how you're able to go slow. And then when I send that email to an incredibly busy person, I cut through the noise because I'm not talking about how we leverage data and insights. We've been in the business for 40 years and we work with companies like da, 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 da. Because I've done the work and I've gotten inside of this person's keystrokes and because I know what actually keeps them up at night and what their priorities are, I'm able to communicate that to them. And when I invest in my customer, then I get to enjoy the fruit of that investment and having that and earning the right to that conversation. And all of this goes back to, and all the, the ICP and the work within it goes back to, it's not, it's not what you do, it's what you do for your customer. We have to stop talking about customer acquisition. We have to stop talking at our customers and we have to start listening to them. We have to start speaking with them and understanding what is it that you do? How do you do it? How frequently that you do you do it? When you do things and it goes wrong, what is the impact? And how does that impact affect the rest of the organization? How does that impact your goals? Whether that be revenue or, or you know, uh, a, a profit or loss, but you can't even begin to unpack all of those questions if you don't understand who that you know, final word is, who that customer is, and get hyper-focused on it. The best piece of advice that I can give you in the companies that I've seen who've been able to in very quick fashion, you know, double revenue while, while, while cutting their sales uh, cycles in half through the MXP has been to focus on the 50. Rather than spray and pray, rather than create this huge, you know, uh, big wide net, focus on finding the 50 human beings, the 50 individuals on the planet who share that worldview who you can identify, there's a digital trail, there's digital breadcrumbs out there where you can actually acquire those customers and secure revenue for the, the most amount of revenue for the least amount of effort. And it sounds scary to do, but again, it's not about your TAM. It's about acquiring your beachhead. And most founders, most teams 
barely have the bandwidth to support a 50 person pipeline, let alone a 500 person pipeline. And when you get down to that 50, your messaging becomes more targeted, your pricing becomes more targeted, your customer acquisition strategy becomes more targeted and every stage where it becomes more targeted, it becomes more effective. And the ROI on your time and the meetings that you take and the learning and the revenue that you acquire accelerate rapidly. So just to wrap up some, some best practices here as you're thinking about customer acquisition, product market fit and ICP, as we talked about it before, we absolutely want to be intentional. Don't improvise. You know, I, I certainly understand the, the siren song of, of DIY, um, but just be so careful because oftentimes we're doing things ourselves and they relate directly back to revenue. We think, oh, we can figure it out. Just another hat to wear. But it's not just the, just because it's free doesn't mean it doesn't have a cost to it. And doesn't mean that that cost might not be unintentionally very high. I mean, a great example, I was working with an entrepreneur in Canada recently um, through the MXP. Company was doing really good. Revenue kept growing, but it kind of plateaued for a while. And we were digging into it and they said, well, hey, Max, I want you to look at some proposals for, for some marketers that we want to bring on. We're looking to spend about $10,000 a month. I said, that's a that's a lot of money to spend on a marketer all of a sudden, what's going on? And they said, well, we're able to close business at the bottom of our funnel. We have a 60% close rate at the bottom of the funnel, which is the definition of product market fit. But our market doesn't respond to email. We have a 0.4% response rate. So we got to change our ICP to something with a bigger market, something that responds to email. Now just think about that for a second. 60% close rate at the bottom of the funnel, 0.4% response rate. Their assumption from that data was that, well, the market, it's the market's fault. The market must not respond to email. How is that likely, right? So what do we do? We looked at their email campaigns and it wasn't an email campaign. It was two emails, 14 days apart, and each one of them was like reading the Old Testament. I mean, it was just a block of highly technical information. It was no wonder no one responded. And we just broke those emails down and we started writing about our ICP and we shared stories about some of the people at the 60% that we'd closed. And that 0.4% jumped up to over 10%. And now they have to throttle how many leads they put into this campaign, which is instead of two touches and now six touches, because if they have too many leads dropped in, the founder doesn't have enough calendar space to close business. Again, just, just think about the time or think about the impact of the misinterpretation of that signal, right? They had the founder's 25-year-old cousin writing that email campaign. And he's a smart kid. He didn't mean anything by it. He was just like, yeah, I'll figure it out. I'll Google some stuff and I'll put it together and we'll run it. So be highly aware of the cost of improvising and like any good scientist, ask why and ask, how do I know this to be true before you make those decisions? Um, following on with the email example, be persistent. It's the single easiest tool any entrepreneur can pick up that most lay on the ground don't mistake no response for no. No response is just simply no response. It's hard to earn the right to get inside of somebody's inbox, yet it is almost free to write an additional email or two. And I'm not telling you to, to pester people and to spam people. Again, I'm telling you to focus on the 50. But if you have actually demonstrated and you can capture that you are providing something of value, you should not be giving up on a market just because you have a whole, bottle, whole lot of no response. You have no idea. You have no idea what's happening on the other person's inbox, right? I mean, how many of us went through this during you know, the past year? You're speaking with somebody and it's going really well. And then all of a sudden they go dark for two weeks and you hear back from them, you know, two and a half weeks later, you say, hey, where'd you go? And they say, sorry, I got COVID or my mom got COVID. And what did you think in your head? I'm stupid, they've gone with somebody else, they go, they went another direction, right? Make no mistake, it is 
personally uncomfortable to write an email or a third email or a fourth email to somebody who hasn't gotten back to you. I totally recognize that. But it is easier as you write each email to actually earn that right. You're demonstrating your, you actually want to earn that person's business as opposed to just throwing it out into the open. I can't tell you how many times I've actually heard people thank me for being persistent. I've heard that 10x more times than somebody say, you're bothering the hell out of me. Just a free tidbit here. If you're on your third or fourth email and you're not hearing back from folks, just start off the email with, you know, again, not your first email or your second or your third, but you, you know, if you want to use this as a Hail Mary, please do and forward it to me if it works. Hi, first name, pardon my persistence. Pardon my persistence and whatever else you want to say. You know, part of my persistence, I really enjoyed our last conversation and wanted to make sure it didn't fall through the email cracks. Here's the follow-up that I wanted to do. You know, do you still have time for it? I don't know why it works, but it works incredibly well. And I think it's because it's both upfront, but it's polite and professional. Um, personalize as much as possible. Don't spray and pray. When you spray and pray, you dilute your messaging. You also dilute the data and the, and, the, and the effectiveness of the data that you create because you're now not controlling for your audience. Your open rates, your clicks rates, your response rates, now they're gonna be artificially low because you're not actually reaching out to everybody who's your ICP. So now you're running multiple experiments at once, but you can't untangle the cord. And the last bit that I'll share is, you know, there are so many silver bullets and hacks and call to actions and subject lines and everything that, that, that surround us as entrepreneurs as do this one thing to get to a million ARR or whatever it might be. The simplest thing that you can do is follow up quickly. There's a number of studies that show that the best thing that you can do to increase deal velocity and avoid leakage is just to be communicative with your customers. When someone reaches out to you over Drift or over email, you have to take that as an opportunity to take your revenue goals, break even, that first customer, whatever you need to get to series A, and start matching it with your revenue behaviors. And that's the key to all of this. Every single one of you are trying to drive you know, profitable businesses at some point. That business, it doesn't come out of thin air. You have to drive activity. And at a certain point, you have to look at your organization, you have to recognize how much time on a daily basis, how much persistence and effort and thought are you actually putting into the acquisition of revenue as opposed to the strategization of revenue or the concept of revenue? Because nothing starts until somebody you know, picks up the phone or shoots over that email or starts building that momentum. So with that, um, I want to thank you all so much for, 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 for listening in. Um, super grateful. I know for, for some of you, it's quite late. So really, really appreciative. Um, you know, for us, again, this is how we meet entrepreneurs, this is how we meet startups. Um, my emails, you know, no kidding secret. I'd love to hear from folks. I'm just max at growthx.com. And again, this is how we help entrepreneurs. We help them through um, our fund and through the MXP and helping entrepreneurs, you know, again, stop improvising and start going to market with intent. So um, I'm super happy to answer any questions, Ollie, and stay on a little bit longer um, and, 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 you know, help out the community any way I can. Again, just super grateful. And thank you, everybody.